Assalamu alaikum, Professor. How are you? Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome. Good morning, uh, Professor Wilson. Welcome. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sorry for delay. No, that's okay. I was so excited. I tried to join 45 minutes early. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, we will start just in two or three minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Please. Uh, Dr. Dara, if you are available, you can start. First of all, the only poster. Only poster, yes. Then another poster is for Dr. Manukian. Yes. But now only the poster, the poster of program. Thank you. Okay, it is sharing, we can see. Thank you. Uh, so you can start. Please okay. start the session, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Does my sound is perfect? Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Hello everyone. My name is Dara Albanna, lecturer at the College of Nursing, Howler Medical University. And I'm a head of department at the nursing department, Michigan International University, and right now, I'm a MSc student in nursing informatics at Tehran University of Medical Sciences. And I'm proud of it. I'm connected now from Iraq. I would like to welcome all audience or audiences from different countries. Thanks for joining the international short course on nursing informatics entitled Professional Roles and Practical Application of nursing informatics. So the host of this program is the School of Nursing and Midwifery of Tehran University of Medical Sciences, Department of Medical Surgical Nursing. It's our honor to have you all there with us. As it's notes that the course will be held in two sessions, one 
in this it, today that will that is 16th of august and the next session will be in sunday 19th august starting at 13 half past 13 uh, gmt time it means is equal to 17th to tehran or iran time so we have two moderators two respective moderators respectful moderators the moderators are will be dr rp manokian which is the vice president of international affairs and assistant professor and the second one will be Dr. Aisha Darvish, uh, sorry, Dr. Asya Darvish, lecturer and head of IT courses at the faculty. With a special thanks to both lecturers who are outstanding pioneers with brilliant nursing informatics experiences from the USA. I appreciate and welcome Professor Marcia Wilson, who is today lectures specifically and she is presented with us right now. In addition to her academic te teaching experience, she is the author of many valuable nursing informatics books and papers. Your participants, please note that you are on mute. If you have any questions throughout the lecture, please write them in the chat box located in the below right panel. Our colleague will try to help you with your technical if issues if you have faced. And please pay attention to the message in the chat box and copy the link which my colleague will send you there. There will be an opportunity to have your questions answers at the end of the lecture. So, the session slides will be available on the website of Tehran University of Medical Sciences. So today's session will be last two hours. First, I will try to ask Dr. Manokian, which is the which she is the international assistant professor and international vice dean of the faculty, and uh, the. Uh, I would like to ask her to start her presentation for us. Dr. Manikian. Thank you very much, Dr. Dara. Uh, is my, my voice okay? Can you yes, hear it now? Perfect. Yes, it's Thank perfect. You. I'll show Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, dear participants. It's my honor and privilege to welcome you all to the fourth series of nursing informatics online short course program entitled uh, Professional Role of Nursing Informatics. Uh, I'm so delighted that uh, our previous courses have been welcomed by our international audiences. And uh, we have the honor to have you uh, once again with us. At the beginning of the program, uh, I'd like to express my gratitude to our esteemed professors, Dr. Wilson, Dr. Rose, and uh, my dear colleague, Dr. Darvish, for their uh, valuable contribution to this program. Also, we have Dr. Dara with us. Uh, as he mentioned, he is one of our MSc's uh, nursing informatics students. And uh, we are happy to have you with us, Dr. Dara. Uh, I keep it short. I just want to announce that uh, the Nursing Informatics has been launched as a degree program. And uh, if you are interested in nursing informatics and you have uh, a nursing background, you can apply now. Um, Actually, uh, nursing informatics uh, has been offered both online and on campus. And uh, if you are interested, you can apply for our master's uh, degree in nursing informatics. And don't forget to share all this information with your friends. Uh, thank you. Uh, I keep it short and I hope you will enjoy the program. Thank you very much.
here, Dr. Dara. Okay. I think uh, maybe he's disconnected. Thank you so much, dear professor, for okay. your. Okay. Uh, I think you forgot to share the slide of Dr. Yes. Would you please yes. show it? Then I will speak. Yes. Share first slide of the Dr. Manukian and Manukian. then second slide is. Manukian about nursing informatics. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. about me at our website. Yes, Dr. Manukian, this is yours. Uh, would you please just uh, introduce very shortly the series of past uh, programs? Yeah, uh, we have different series of nursing informatics programs. Uh, but my focus is about the uh, master degree. Here you can find uh, our uh, link. <coughs> you can appear for both uh, on campus and uh, online. Uh, also, we can share all this information with you. If any question, you can propose. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think the first slide was just uh, what you want to show uh, about the MSc of Nursing Informatics, but I yeah. don't know why it is missed. Okay, no yes, problem. This one. This one. Yes, this yeah. is okay. Just this one. Thank you. Yeah. Here you can. Uh, see the information about both uh, online and also on campus program and uh, you can apply and add the required uh, documents here. It's an international program and uh, we have the opportunity to benefit from our international team professors, including Dr. Wilson and Dr. Rose also. Thank you, Dr. Darvish. Thank you so much. So, so I, I also want to speak only for two minutes. Mm, I, uh, would you please uh, share my slide, the second one? Okay. Actually, I want to um, send my uh, appreciation to all the participants. Uh, some of uh, them were uh, in uh, our past uh, programs, they were with us. No, this is not the poster. The, the, another, the second uh, slide, please. Yes. Slide number two, thank you. Um, and also uh, special thanks to Dr. Marisa Wilson. Uh, she is the professor of uh, uh, Alabama University. And actually, uh, I want to say that uh, uh, she was in a second course with us, and we learned a lot. Um, and she is the pioneer of nursing informatics, and I prepared you in the slide to see uh, the um, announcement from AMIA, American Medical Informatics Association, and American Nursing Informatics Association uh, from uh, before one or two months. And they introduced uh, Professor Marisa Wilson as pioneer of nursing informatics. Uh, yes, this is the correct slide, thank you. And would you please, next slide. Uh, next slide, you will see the, um, yes, this is the, the topic for today. Um, we have the honor to uh, benefit, um, I think, all the experiences of Dr. Marisa Wilson uh, from many years, uh, her uh, work and uh, activities on nursing informatics. And would you please next slide? Um, yes, this is uh, what you, I told you about uh, from AMIA Nursing Informatics, and this is uh, you can see about uh, the, her award uh, 
uh, from 2022, she received the uh, American Nursing uh, um, Award, for, and you can see in CIN Journal, which is ISI Journal, about uh, her. Uh, and also, uh, she had many books and uh, many articles, and uh, I'm proud uh, to have this opportunity to um, uh, listen to her uh, valuable lecture. And also, in this slide, uh, this slide uh, should, goes, uh, should go ahead just in one second, uh, each slide, but I don't know why it is a stop. But um, I want to talk about uh, other professionals. For example, next session, we have Dr. Melody Rose. As you see, this is the Handbook of Informatics for Nurses and um, uh, Healthcare Professionals, which in chapter 20, I had uh, the honor uh, to be co-author uh, with uh, Professor Tony Hebda. And this book is published uh, uh, by Professor Tony Hepta and colleagues, and uh, Dr. Melody Rose, who we have her next session, also is uh, another author of the book. I congratulate them, and also I ask you if you, you are interested in nursing informatics, this is a very a nice uh, handbook about that. And uh, another book is with me. I don't know if you can see it or not, uh, which I could... Uh, purchase uh, that's from USA someone sent me uh, this is also a new book uh, and uh, it's uh, I actually I actually want to recommend you these two books and uh, also in next slide, I was uh, talking about how Professor Hepta also is a pioneer. Uh, we had her lecture, Dr. Rose, uh, Professor Marisa Wilson in our previous sessions and uh, some of my books and activities in Iran. And um, also uh, there is uh, in uh, many programs I have uh, for Persian for my country and also international programs uh, with the help of um, Dr. Manukian and the uh, Dean of the University. And I want to thank uh, all the colleagues, uh, Mrs. Uh, Smiley, who send you uh, messages in the chat box, uh, Mrs. Sadati, who is from Upraise to Raise team, and uh, Dr. Dara, who is our Master of Science student uh, from Arbil. And uh, so um, I would uh, like to express my gratitude to Professor Marisa Wilson uh, because she accepted our invitation. Um, so please, you can continue. And if you have any question, you can write in chat box. Thank you. Speech. Thank you so much for the termination and for you, uh, dear Professor Dekele Dervish. Now we, we are going to start our first session for today, which will be presented by Professor Victoria Maricia Wilson. The session is entitled, Are We Preparing Competent and Capable Nurses to Lead the Digital Health Evolution or Not? So Victoria will present. Just I want to mention a brief points regarding the a bio, a biography regarding the Victoria Wilson. Uh, she's Associated Professor of UAB School of Nursing, the University of Alabama at Birmingham, US, United States of America. Interim Department Chair of for Family, Community and Health Systems at the University of, uh, of UAB School of Nursing coordinator of the MSN Nursing Informatics Program. She is director of the Graduate Leadership Pathway. And she has a doctorate of nursing science from the John, Hop John, Hop John Hopkins University School of Public Health and Nursing. She is a faculty member at the Executive Director of, practice, of Nursing Practice, DNP, host BNS DNP, post MSN DNP, and MSN program at 
uh, at her university. She is active in nursing informatics leadership for the American Academy of Nursing, AMIA, and HIMSS and TIGER. She is a board member of, of CPH, IMS and a member of the AMIA AHIC working group. Dr. Wilson is a task force member for the re involution of the AACN essentials and term that revised the NAA scope, American Nursing Association scope, and standards of nursing informatics practice. So uh, please, Dr. Wilson, the floor is yours, and we are all eyes and ears for you in for you in viable lectures. And it may take about 60 to 90 minutes. So please feel free if you want to have a break between the slides, please <coughs> let me know. And uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. And thank you for that introduction. I really need to shorten it. I'm, I'm no longer the interim department chair. I gave up that role so I could focus more on my informatics. Are you hearing me okay? Yes, Professor. It's perfect. Yes. Okay, good. And I'm sorry, once in a while I have to take some water. My mouth is very dry from some medicine. So the topic of my conversation is, are we preparing competent and capable nurses to lead to the digital health evolution? And I am speaking to you from a U.S. perspective. However, because I'm the North American representative to the International Medical Informatics Association Nursing Informatics Special Interest Group, IMEA, I work with colleagues from all over the world, UK, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, um, many countries, and we're all struggling with the same question. So this question is not uh, unique to my country uh, or any one country, but as technology infiltrates, our nurses are lagging behind in many instances. So again, this is from a US perspective. If there are any questions, please, let me know if you don't understand what I'm saying. If I talk too fast, please let someone know so I can slow down and clarify. So that's me. Um, and you got my background. I'm not going to go back into it. But basically, I deal with all things graduate um, that do not end at a nurse practitioner. So I have leadership, informatics, population health, public health. I was a nurse for many years. I cared for patients. I did public health, community health, and academia administration. So I have an agenda, and I have a lot of information on these slides, but never fear. I am not going to be going in detail on any one, because any one of them could be a lecture unto itself, but you will have it for your information. So I want to go through what is pushing us in academia and professional development. And what I mean by professional development in the U.S., once someone graduates from school and they take on a role like nursing or whatever, they have to continue learning, right? They can't stop. Your, your, your learning doesn't end when you get your degree. You have to take some courses or maybe get some certificates or something. But we have to continue to develop professionally particularly in informatics because things change. I will also explain to you who has oversight all over our schools in the US because this is what drives what we have to do. I'll talk about nursing and the digital evolution and I don't call it a revolution because we're very, very slow. We're not like other industries. We're very slow and careful and methodical and we have to be. I will show you that we do have a competency capability gap talk to you about a model that a group of us are developing to help bridge this gap from the time a person is a student to the time they get out and they're practicing and they're, you know, whatever they're going to be. Um, we're going to talk about the academic sector, the professional development sector, and then some post, uh, some hot topics we're all 
wrangling with. So background, we have driving forces and we have pushing forces and we have all kinds of forces in the U.S. pushing us toward having better, competent and capable nursing nurses at all levels in dealing with informatics as a process of data to information to knowledge and the health information technologies, a whole wealth of them, not just EHRs, but everything else that a nurse will encounter in their work. And we're like in academia, like that giant boat on the right. We got these forces pressing us, but to turn that boat around and change it into a different direction with all that weight on it takes a lot of effort. And that's where we are right now trying to turn that boat around. So some of our shaping forces that are happening here in the U.S., Society's demanding more technology, right? They're getting used to their smartwatches, their smartphones, their apps. They want more. Particularly post-pandemic, uh, post-COVID, when we move toward telehealth and all those things, people don't want to necessarily run to the doctor. They want care when and where they need it, when and where they need it. So society is demanding us. Consumers have expectations now. So, you know, the old people like me are dying off and all the young ones who are attached to their cell phone, this is what they want. We have practice partners. And what I mean by practice partners is when a student graduates from school, from nursing school or whatever, people hire them. And those hiring people have expectations of those students. We cannot send them students ill-prepared because they wind up spending a lot of money to do professional development to upskill those students. They should be able to hit the ground running. We have an expansion of technology. Every time you turn around, there's a new technology coming into our practices somewhere. In the US, we also have health information technology, public policy that impacts care. We have federal policy coming from the federal level that says our technologies have to improve outcomes. They have to gather certain kinds of data. They have to be interoperable. We have to be secure, all these things. So we have these public policies come down on top of us that say, you must do the following things. And now we have competency-based education requirements to meet the students' needs and to get our schools accredited. And what I mean is we can no longer just give students a quiz. They have to demonstrate the competency and they have to demonstrate mastery of that over the time that they are in their plan of study. And that includes informatics. Okay, I just got the chat box. I just wanna make sure there's no pressing questions. I'm sure someone else can watch the chat box for me. So, um, come on. This is the environment our nurses are working in today when they walk out. Uh, we've got nurses sitting at banks of computers doing telenursing, telehealth, e-monitoring. We have nurses in different locations. Of course, we have nurses who are uh, caring for patients. We have robotics, that's Moxie on the far right, who is uh, being implemented in several hospitals to do those things that nurses shouldn't have to do like delivering stuff, going down and getting a med and coming back up and bringing it to the nurse. We also have a lot of work being done in the far left bottom with elder care, um, Alzheimer's, other dementias, agitation, with these weird little creatures. <laughs> um, and I had the pleasure of seeing them at MedInfo a couple years ago, and they're kind of weird, but apparently uh, they vibrate and do different things that help calm patients down who have dementia, delirium. So there's a lot of work in that sector, keeping our elders at home and safe. And then we have nurses with on social media. So all kinds of things going on. And every day there's a new thing. And so we see healthcare evolving towards digital health. And digital health is very hard to define. There is no one definition because it, it applies to transformation. So every time there's a new technology or a new transformation, we're being pushed further and further to digital health. So it's broad, it's multidisciplinary. 
and it includes concepts that are at the intersection of technology and healthcare, but there is no one definition for it. It includes our EHRs, of course, but also mobile apps, wearable devices, telemedicine, all the all those things that keep coming and going that our patients want to use. I want to give you an example of a full blown, and there's a YouTube on here that you can look at. I'm not going to play it for sake of time, but this is a hospital in the U.S. in which there are no patients in that building, no patients. It's Mercy Virtual. All their patients are being monitored by nurses and physicians like this lady on the right. And those patients are in the community in their home. So there's nobody in that building except the people monitoring. And we're seeing more and more of this. We call it hospital at home. We have new roles for nurses we have to be cognizant of. Right now, post COVID, when we all went to telehealth, we started expanding the role of virtual nursing. This was unheard of. These are totally new roles that are springing up where the, the various hospital systems is still defining what this virtual nurse does. They can do patient education, admission and discharge data gathering. They can do nurse support. So <clears throat> like many countries, we're losing a lot of our workforce. They're tired, they're burnt out. We want to keep those nurses that have a lot of experience because we have a lot of young nurses who are in roles that they might be um, not totally prepared for, like the ICU or whatever. So we're using virtual nursing with all the technologies we have, the sound, the visual, everything else, to help guide those nurses with their care. They can zoom in, they can look at the patient, they can look at the data, they can answer questions by the patient, they can answer questions by the nurse, they can help the nurse. So <clears throat> those nurses observe and act um, to support the nurses who are actually at the bedside caring for the nurse. And this brings up some interesting things. Like we need to, we're writing job descriptions now. The roles are already out there, but we're writing job descriptions. In one case that I know of, they, um, they advertised for a virtual nurse position and they had over 200 applicants apply for that position. It was amazing. We need to understand the educational levels that these virtual nurses need to have, their experience level, and we need to understand what are their competencies to work behind the camera and deal with all the technology and the distance that they may be in. We have a hospital in the US that is a Jewish hospital. The virtual nurses that support the nurses in this hospital are in Israel, which I think is very interesting. They're not even in the same country. So this expansion of technologies is pushing, pushing, pushing us with all these new capabilities, digital voice assistants that are trying to reduce documentation burden. Of course, artificial intelligence is everywhere. My God, I can't get away from it. Um, and people don't really understand what that is. You talk about chat GPT as if it's artificial intelligence, it's a product. There are many others, but we need to, under, we need to have an understanding at a very basic level of what the models are that drive these uh, artificial intelligence models. We have to understand the various layers and how that hidden layer inside, we don't always know what that algorithm is calculating. Our input layer is the data that our nurses are putting in. Is that data reflective of the populations we serve? We're finding here in the US, it isn't. It's reflective of certain populations, but not everybody. So the output that we're getting is not necessarily trustworthy. And again, as I say, based from the artificial intelligence, we have robotics and drones that are moving around some of our hospitals that are being driven by that. As I said before, we have all these assisted living things trying to keep our elders at home, aging in place safely. So we have smart homes that will uh, track if they've gotten out of bed, have they moved around? Have they gone in the kitchen? Do they go to the bathroom? And if we're seeing different patterns of data, uh, community nursing can go in and find out what's going on with that person. We have clinical decision support tools now. 
uh, mobile health apps, telehealth, telemedicine, telemental health, and then of course it's child virtual nursing. So all these driving forces are pushing us toward a more digital evolution. Personalized and precision healthcare, that's a big thing for me. That includes your genomics, reading your genomics, being able to tailor your care to the social determinants of health, where you live, where you work, where you pray, where you eat, the community you live in, to your genome, and to give you exactly what kind of treatment you need. We're writing competencies now for nurses to be able to educate patients on this. And of course we have social media and online information, which can be good and can be very, very bad. And I'd like to see nursing more involved in helping educate patients online versus a lot of the disinformation that people have that we saw based on COVID vaccines and the like. And at the bottom, this is really interesting. That's virtual augmented reality. We're using that in nursing schools too. But here you see elders who were kind of like looking at the beach and being calm because they're in this virtual reality thing, which I think is very, very interesting. So how are we doing all of this? It is so difficult. Remember, we're like that big boat. We're trying to turn it around. Well, we have a combination of clinical practice and education working together. We are like a factory, those of us in academia. We have to produce a product that can be used in the, in the practice arena and be used the minute they hit the ground. So if we look at the far right picture, this is an actual picture of a patient being turned during COVID and the, well, I didn't have fully get the all the technology that's in there, but this is the environments in which many of our nurses are working. So we have all these expectations. We have to educate and hire competent healthcare informatics professionals. And I mean nurses at all levels, from your bench entry to practice nurse, all the way up to your nurse who's getting a graduate degree in informatics. We have to up those skills to meet this need because we have competency expectations of our students and grads. We have development, comp competency development of them across time. We have to, in schools, we have to align our curricula to meet this. As I said, we're doing competency-based education. We now can't just give them an exam. They have to demonstrate their competency. So we have to figure out assessment processes for this. We want to be able to certify professionals in their professional development, that they've continued their education. And what's important in the United States is our schools are accredited, which means we have an agency that sets out the competency expectations for our nurses. For us, it's called the American Academy of Colleges of Nursing. It sets the competency expectations for all nurses baccalaureate to doctorate, BMP, um, and they do redo this about every five or so years. That's where you get the essentials. This is what we have to meet. We have a separate agency that then gives us some time to make these changes in the schools. They come in, they look at everything, big, big document, they spend days with us, and they make sure we are actually doing that. They talk to students, they talk to grads, they talk to our practice partners that hire. They look at our courses, they talk to faculty, they go through everything. And we must be accredited. And generally we're accredited for seven to 10 years. Without accreditation, we cannot, our students cannot get financial aid. They can't go on to certain schools. It's a disaster for the schools. So we have these expectations and then we have this body that comes in and makes sure we're actually doing it. And right now we are in the process of responding to the 2021 AACN new essentials that I share with you in this thing that lays out what we've got to meet, our competencies for all nurses at um, entry to practice and advanced levels. We're going to have a couple years to make all these changes. So we're trying to turn that ship, right? And then our accrediting bodies are going to come in and review what we're doing. So 
we're in this real state of um depends on where you work some place panic <laughs> some places are okay and it's just a lot of work my place is okay because we have informatics people that work there but it's a lot of work to do this to change all the courses change all the ways we assess we have to mentor new professionals when they go in we have to hire we have to we have to increase the hiring expectations of our employers on many nursing job descriptions they don't mention informatics and they need to and then we have to ensure post graduation there's continuous professional development that is an expectation of the AACN and again these are shaped by societal demand our public policy needs and we as schools are charged with producing these competent and capable professionals that can meet the need are we doing this? Well, in the past, no, we were not. And data shows that. So that's why the essentials had to come in and be totally re-envisioned. And I'm proud to say I wrote Domain 8 and I was able to write the informatics and information technology with actually measurable competencies and subcompetencies. The previous ones were not written very well. And in the schools, when you didn't have an informatician, they were like, well, I don't really understand this, so I don't I don't know what to teach. I'm just going to, I don't know, teach the EHR or something. But none of this stuff was being taught in many schools. There are some refer, ref, reference I'm giving you for assessing informatics competencies among students and faculty. I'm not going to go through these. They're here. I've given you lots and lots and lots of resources. Again, our competencies are coming from primarily the American Association of Colleges of Nursing. We have about 21, 2,100 nursing schools in the U.S. About half of them are overseen by the American Colleges of Nursing because they oversee those degree programs that are baccalaureate and higher. We also have associate degree programs and other programs that have a different body that oversees them, the National League for Nursing. AMIA sets out competencies, particularly for informaticians. And Tiger did an international, HIMS Tiger, an international competency synthesis project where they looked at competencies from all across the world and synthesized them down by role. And that's a really good resource for you. The Canadians have done the same thing. So we have a need, right? We're not producing competent, capable nurses to meet all that stuff we haven't been. We've got surveys and data to prove it, right? I'm not, I'll, you can see it here that we are producing nurses with a lack of knowledge and skills. We were, um, lack of, there's a lack of availability of training, both for the students and the faculty who have to teach because we have to rely on faculty who aren't necessarily informaticians to teach some of this content within their coursework. If they're teaching pediatrics or community health, there's informatics in everything up to us as informaticians to help highlight that. We also have to go in and train facility educators. These are the people that will continue working with the new grad who enters their hospital to continue their education and their professional development. They don't also know anything about this in many cases. So this is being pushed on us from the AACM and what's called the future of nursing leading change, advancing health. They do this every 10 years, but they tell us what we should be doing. So we're being pushed in another number of directions. So our essentials, our re-envisioned essentials, and the full PDF is at the bottom. You can open it up, but we have 10 domains, knowledge for nursing practice, which is really evidence-based practice, person-centered care, population health, which is another one that people are scared of, Scholarship for nursing practice, which is how to do quality improvement or research, quality and safety, interprofessional partnerships. Our nurses have to learn to work with their physician peers, their therapy peers, social worker peers. So that's something they got to learn to work in those teams and communicate. Systems-based care, meaning they can't just learn about the unit they're in. They have to learn about their hospital, how their hospital is connected to other hospitals, how those hospitals are connected to public health and so on and so forth. So they got to learn how systems work, not just I do my little job with my patient. Then we have information and healthcare technology. That was my domain. Professionalism. 
having these nurses understand that they're professionals. They're not just data entry clerks or task doers. They need to take responsibility for what they do. And then there's personal, professional, and leadership development. This is the ongoing professional development angle. Their, their knowledge doesn't stop when they get their degree. And we have all these concepts for nursing practice that are integrated within the essentials, clinical judgment, communication, compassionate care, diversity, equity, inclusion, which means we are dealing with everyone equally, ethics, evidence-based practice, health policy, not heat policy, and social determinants of health. The future of nursing is pushing us toward transforming our practice, transforming education, transforming leadership, and meeting the needs for better, da better data on the healthcare workforce and health in general. We have the ANA, Scope and Standards of Nursing Informatics Practice, which then looks at what we're supposed to be doing with the nurse informatician. They have their categories, they have the roles and responsibilities, but they don't necessarily designate out a uh, measurable competency, but it's a good thing to look at. When we go forward with the informatician as they're moving through their progression, we also have the American Medical Informatics Association Advanced Health Informatics uh, Competencies, AHIC, which incorporates statements on knowledge, skills, attitudes, and abilities. So it's pushing our informaticians who should have gotten a good foundation from the essentials to have a higher level of knowledge, which includes things like interprofessional collaboration, leadership skills, being able to communicate is very, very important. Health information, science, and technology, which involves all the kinds of technologies one is involved in and the core tools that are dependent upon application areas in your training. They are to focus on things like human factors and socio-technical systems. If you're not familiar with socio-technical system model, that is the people, the process, po the policy, the technology, and how they all interact to make things successful. They also have to understand the social and behavioral aspects of health. Generally, that's not a problem for nurse informaticians because they understand the social and behavioral aspects of health. But when you're talking about informaticians who may be coming from computer science, they don't often understand these things. Here's the domains for AMIA AHIC, you can see. And again, this is a little more detail about AMIA AHIC competencies um, that they're pushing forward for informaticians. Now, our non-physician informaticians like nurses can take a, a, an advanced certification exam to AMIA that covers these kinds of topics. Um, and that's available for you to do now. I think they're on their th third cohort. So this is everybody who's master's degree prepared and higher, who has a degree in health informatics or nursing informatics or any form of informatics. We also have to help them understand that informatics has subgroups, right? And I was in a meeting yesterday where we were trying to tease out the core essential competencies and expectations of all these subgroups. But we have clinical informatics who deal with things like EHR and everything within the clinical environment. We have health informatics, which deals with just about pretty much everything related to, you know, well, clinical, but as well as what patients want to do at home, monitoring their health. We have public health informatics, we have nursing informatics, pharmacy informatics, radiology informatics, I didn't list them all, um, laboratory informatics. Well, we all have a core, right? But we have sort of this focus on what, what it is that we're working in, but we share a core and we should all understand that core as informaticians and appreciate that others may have a slightly different focus in what they're doing. And these are what we have in common. This is used with permission of Ramona Nelson, and it's our good old data to information to knowledge to wisdom trajectory. And how these elements build upon one another with data just being naming and collecting and not having any meaning. It's organized to information. Information is interpreted and integrated and you form knowledge. 
And then ultimately you apply that information over time and you develop wisdom. And this is in a constant state of change um, because we're always learning new things, right? So let's talk a bit about nursing informatics from the US perspective, because this is coming out of the um, scope of standards of nursing informatics practice. Our new definition is nursing informatics is a specialty that transforms data into needed information and leverages the technologies to improve health, health equity, safety, quality, and outcomes. So our data to information model stays in there, but our focus is on health, health equity, meaning everybody has an opportunity to improve their health. We don't leave certain groups out. We think about safety and quality and the outcomes that we're achieving, whether those outcomes are patient outcomes or care outcomes or systems outcomes. We also have to, in nursing informatics, because we're trying to push everyone toward understanding what this is, that it is not new and neither is informatics or information technology. Informatics is a process where you take data to information to knowledge, right? We used to have to do it on paper. We would go back and look at a paper chart. Maybe we would check off an Excel spreadsheet, right? We can now do it much faster because we have information technologies. But we've had information technologies for many, many years. Many of our students who are looking at informatics for the first time, whether they're entry to practice nurses, because we're trying to give everyone education and informatics at a certain level. They think this is all new because they just have been gun seeing in the last 10 years. <clears throat> a lot of EHRs coming into their environment and I have to remind them, nope, we've been doing this for a long time. In fact, here's some pictures proving it. <laughs> Nurses working on computers going back to, I don't know, the 50s, 60s when we had gigantic computers and then look at this radio news thing in the middle from 1924. They were trying to figure out how to make a telehealth uh, application with whatever technology they had in 1924. So it's not new. We, we who are in informatics have been trying to have a digital evolution since 1924. Um, all right. We've been working on electronic health records since the 60s. We've had hospitals that have had rudimentary EHRs, order entry, some CPOE. You can see University of Utah, they had the help system. That was one of the first decision support systems in, in place. Massachusetts General in the 60s going into the 70s had a system called CoStar or Computer Stored Ambulatory Records. Um, the Institute of Medicine published their To Air is Human that said basically we were killing a lot of people and we had to uh, get our data on computer systems. But we have been working with that over time. Our VA, our Veterans Administration, had been developing a program in-house called VISTA where they were documenting all the care for the um, VA patients since the 1980s. They were one of the earliest users of barcode medication administration. I went to see them in the 80s. So we have had this stuff in the works for decades. And now suddenly we have a lot of it going on and we have to catch up. So our nurses are capable and competent to deal with this. So again, we have a long and storied history in nursing informatics. We need to be proud. Since the 50s, we've had Harriet Worley, who identified data processing needs for healthcare and started to explore the potential uses of computers by nurses in various care settings. In the 60s, we had the American Nurses Association Committee identify priorities for the use of these new computers by nurses because they were starting to move from those big giant mainframes to, well, desktops that weren't that much smaller, but you know, we could at least not be in a room. In the 70s, we had the first report of a computer application used for nurses. In the 80s, we had, of course, our dearly departed Dr. Virginia Saba, 
who organized the first track for nursing at the Symposium on Computer Applications and Medical Care, or SCAMC. This became AMIA, right? Now, for those of you don't, who don't know, Dr. Saba is truly a pioneer. And she passed away about six months or so ago. And we're still, we're still finding out the many things that she did to um, push informatics forward. We had a nursing minimum data set that was developed by doctors Worley and Norma Lang that said we should at least, at least at a minimum, be collecting the following data. Oops. In the 80s, we had nursing terminologies under development. Now, standardized nursing terminologies, the bane of my existence, were developed in the 80s before we really understood about computers and computer systems. <clears throat> so the original terminologies were not, were not developed correctly for usage within computer systems. We didn't have concepts, we didn't have knowledge models, we didn't have any of this stuff, but it was at least a beginning. Uh, in 1990s, we had web-based applications that were developed because of the internet spread. And the American Nurses Association and the National League for Nurses convened a conference on nursing informatics leadership. And they produced a, a document called Next Generation Nursing Information Systems, Essential Characteristics for Professional Practice. Sorry. In 1994, our first scope and standards of nursing informatics was published. So we need to be proud of our long and storied history. So when our colleagues say, oh, this is all new, it is not new. We've been messing with this for at least, gosh, the 50s takes us to 70 years. Oh, Lord Almighty. Anyway, we need to let people know we've had a long history and nurses have led the way. I'm telling you, nurses led the way. We had the first scope and standards. We had the first graduate programs. We had the first specialty that designated nursing. And now physicians come to us and want to know how did we do that. So we need to be proud. But we need innovative strategies to ensure all of our nurses, whether they're practicing nurses at the bedside or nurse informaticians, have what they need to fully participate in today's world with all that technology coming in. And we know we have huge gaps in faculty knowledge who have to teach, the educators once they graduate, of course our students because they get what the faculty and educators teach them, which often has big gaps. So our graduates have gaps, our practicing nurses have gaps, our nurse leadership, who generally came up through the ranks over time, never got this information, and neither did many of our nurse executives. And yes, sadly, some of our nurse informaticians are poorly prepared. I did see a hand up. Was there a question or something people didn't understand? I just want to check. I just want to make sure there's nothing in the chat box. I don't see anything. Okay. I just saw a hand flash up. And because we have these significant gaps, this is impacting our nurse participation and leadership in the digital health evolution, wherever they practice, whether it's in a hospital, community, home, wherever these nurses practice, we are not always at the table. We are not always participating. We are not always leading those very things that impact us every day. So, okay, come back. Why am I not, my ability to move this down? Okay, so again, digital health, we have no definition. It's defined differently by different people. So these gaps keep changing. It refers to many different technologies. So expand your brain from the EHR, right? And the focus should be on what healthcare, Health, healthcare is like now and what will it be like in a digital world with things like virtual nursing, generative AI, robotics, mobile health, all the things we have. Digital health 
is it evolution because we have had slow change? Remember, we've been working on this since the 50s. Again, looking at the landscape, this is a repeat. I'm not going to repeat it, but we have all these kinds of things that we're facing right now. Again, there is a gap, and I don't know how many of you have been to England, but I love mine, the gap that's in all the subways, because if we don't mind the gap, we're going to get run over by the train or fall down in that hole. So we have to be mindful of the gaps. Yes, I do see a raised hand. Is there a question? Uh, yes, of course, Professor. We have a question, but uh, do you want to answer it right now or to be at the end of the session? Well, let me, let me find out what the question is in case somebody didn't understand what I was saying. Okay. Yes. I think it's Mary Shabu. Yeah, yeah. Salam. Good evening, doctors. It has been a great lectures from you. So I have a question. I've understood everything that you said, but I just have some questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. My first my first question is, as you explained everything here, so how do we improve the cooperation and the working together togetherness of nurses and other health healthcare workers through this the um the use of informatics mm -hmm. that's the best question so the second question is what is the most important anticipation or goal that we wish to achieve as nursing informatics in the future sure. okay good hey. and i am going to answer those in my next series of slides so if i don't you can Come back at me at the end, okay? Sure, thank you. So we have these gaps. We have an environment that's saying we have to have competent and capable nurses. We have technology that's coming in from every single direction, regardless of where you work. It's impacting all nurses. We have to have them understand technology is caring. It is not a separate thing as a silo. Um, it is part of their day-to-day -day activities, just like a stethoscope, right? We don't teach them to put the stethoscope around their neck and walk around with it. We teach them how to use it. So again, data is showing that we have these competencies and capability gaps. And here are the articles that tell you that the competency and capability gaps are among the graduates, the students, and the faculty. We know that we have to help them understand that this is a priority. This is not a secondary thing, that our work is reliant upon these technologies that we use every day, and that nurses have not kept pace with the fast-paced changes to digital technology and their impact on care. Sorry, there's a typo in there. And again, to clarify for what I'm saying, our postgraduate, our pre-graduate nurses are all of our nurses who are entering for their BSN, their entry to practice. We also have advanced nurses who are getting master's degrees and higher. Post-graduation is those who are newly licensed, newly hired, current employees, and maybe employees interested in a super user type role. This impact, this gap impacts organizations, right? Because of the lack of recognition that informatics is a process, that the nurses are not just data entry clerks, that they should have access to information and knowledge. The inability of nurses to assess the full spectrum of information technologies that they use is a problem. Generally, we focus on an EHR, but there's more than just the EHR, right? The EHR is important, but there's more than that. We have very poor nurse and nurse leadership participation in workflow redesign. These technologies affect the root of how you do your work, how you communicate, how you interact with your patients and your colleagues. You need to participate in workflow redesign to help understand what's happening to your practice and to also help um, deal with things like documentation burden and miscommunication. We have ineffective nurse and nurse leader anticipation of that successful design and implementation. So our nurse leadership, and this is hard to do now because of work, uh, workforce issues, our nurse leadership doesn't always invest in having nurses participate in these activities when it's going on. 
This causes a potential for additional documentation burden, which means nurses are just documenting a lot of stuff that they don't necessarily use. It's taking up time. We have limited provider vision regarding the possibility in the evolution, right? Our providers don't often see this evolution and what it all means and what it could mean and how good it could be. We have failure to achieve the use of data to support care. We have wasted financial time and human resources on this. And all of this gives us a potential for unexpected negative consequences when you have communication, workflow disruptions, documentation burden, all these other things we can have negative consequences. So uh -huh, my group has a proposed model that is evidence-based that has been tested in a few places that we are trying to test it in more, but it is a very difficult model to follow because it requires systems, systems level thinking and collaboration between faculty, educators, operational leaders in hospitals, vendors, and other innovators and entrepreneurs. We need everybody to help with this. So we have a novice to expert trajectory based on Benner. The novice is the pre-licensure nurse and the expert is the graduate prepared informatician. Again, it requires collaboration among many, many partners. And we have to rethink the way we educate and the way we conduct professional development. We've got to collaborate with these partners. And again, that includes faculty, educators in our facilities, operations leadership, our nurse leadership, vendors, vendors who sell things. They can come in and show a video on Moxie and what it does, right? They may not be able to bring Moxie because it's kind of big, hard to get Moxie in an airplane. Um, and other innovators and our nurse entrepreneurs who see a problem and go out and try to fix it, right? We have those people. We need to shine on them so that we can show other nurses, when you see something that doesn't work, how can we bring that to an actual product or whatever they're doing? Here is our model for student to novice to expert pipeline. Those little things that look like red lightning bolts are where gaps often exist. It includes the student, the new graduate hire, the ongoing professional development activities, all the way to the informatic specialty, specialist and the super user. And it includes collaboration with faculty, educators, um, all the rest of them, operations, industry. We all have to cooperate together. I'm fortunate I sit in the school where we have multiple schools of medicine, whatever, we have nursing, we have a big informatics department. We have a hospital right around us, right across the street. But there are schools that don't have these resources, but they have students in them. So we have to look around and say, how can we help them? We have to be clear and concise in what we're trying to do. We have to follow our AACN essentials for those of us who are overseen by this. We have to look at the TIGER recommended uh, international competencies. We can go to the HIT comp and look by role. That's a very nice tool. You can go into this HIT comp. It's part of the Tiger synthesis. And you can go in by role and find out what people should be doing. And then in the US, the American Organization of Nurse Leaders, AONL, has redone their expectations for nurse leadership at the executive level and what they understand from informatics. So we have all these opportunities for faculty, facility educators, but we have to offer those opportunities and support them. My group with Nursing Knowledge Big Data Science, AMIA, HIMSS, we are doing this through a number of organizations. HIMSS, ANEA, and our Nursing Knowledge Big Data Science group are all producing development materials for our faculty at all levels, that they can use to educate themselves, that they can use to educate their students. We don't really care. We're putting it out there for people to use. 
We are also pushing that nurse job descriptions include informatics and information technology expectations because many nurse job descriptions don't say a word about this. We want our facility educators to include informatics and information technology in their own skill set. And we want career ladders to be developed to include advancing informatic skills and involvement. So nurses who want to, who have an inclination to participate as a super user should be supported and cultivated in their degree, you know, seeking a degree, helping them become a full-fledged informatician. So that's our model that we're working on. It's a big model. We're still in the process of, of getting this implemented. And then evaluated, we have some places that are doing pieces and parts, but not the whole thing. And we're trying to put it together. Again, we have to strengthen this pipeline that we've got going on with competency expectations that are clear and concise, roles and responsibilities that expect nurses to be able to participate, and that's reinforced. Ongoing professional development, collaboration, as I said, Provider, participa pr provider participation in the processes. And of course, our leadership, our nursing leadership at all levels, whether it's academia, healthcare industry, has to buy in and support this. In our academic sector, we are trying very hard to upskill all of our nursing faculty on the topic of informatics and information technology at the level they need because they have to include some of this information in their courses. If they are teaching the very baby nurse how to document a patient assessment, they are teaching them about data, accurate data, right? They need to be teaching that baby nurse that that data can form information. Look at your blood pressure, look at the med that the patient's on. This is your information. They also have to help that baby nurse understand that, that data is not staying with that patient, that it's going to measure um, outcomes from the unit, the hospital, it goes to public health, it goes to population health. So they need to know that their data has a life beyond what they're doing and the importance of that data. If they're teaching advanced nurses who are dealing with pediatric patients, we need to help them understand how clinical decision support works within the context of order entry. That's just two examples. And we have been developing case studies, sorry, that can be used within courses, unfolding case studies that can be adapted based on your subject matter that you're teaching for those who are not informaticians by trade. But you can use these in your courses to help explain where informatics and information technology is supporting your care because it's not separate. We don't separate, can't, we can't separate. Informatics is not over there like a silo. We do know that we are in alignment to other strategic initiatives like our competency-based education requirements now where students can no longer just take a test or write a paper, but have to demonstrate a skill across time. We know we're being pushed by the future of nursing. We know that we are being pushed whether we like it or not, by the influx of digital health tools. We know that we have workforce issues that might be helped by using informatics and information technology. We know that post COVID, we are doing much bigger expansion into population health, meaning being able to look at populations of people, not just a patient, but maybe part of a city or whatever, that we can help them with their um, various things that contribute to their health outcome. And then of course, we have to strengthen the public health sector. We saw that with COVID. So we are developing educational materials and methods that can support and align with these materials taught at the level they need to be, whether it's a faculty member or a student. And we're trying to develop the assessment of competency strategies. In the professional development side on the, after the graduate, they're also trying to take their onboarding stuff and what they do every year and build informatics and information technology into it. But the educators that do this in the hospitals have to be educated. 
that we know that they need basic data management, they need basic skills. We know that there's an opportunity that they could be if they participate in decreasing their workload using technology. We also know that all healthcare providers need to be able to use all the technologies, not just the EHR, and understand the best ways to use them. Our facility educators need professional development and support, and our new higher orientation should include more than just how to move around a basic EHR and the functions of an EHR. We have to develop role-based workflow. We can use things like HIT comp. We need clinical ladders. We have to develop ongoing professional continuing education, and we have to develop career ladders within the institutions so that a nurse who's inclined to can become a super user and maybe be developed into a master's prepared and higher informatician. But we've got challenges, a lot of challenges. And this is actually my last slide. I just wanna make sure I'm okay and timely. Yeah, okay. We have documentation burden. I don't know how many of you have been dealing with this, but Back in the days when we had paper, and I worked as a nurse when we had paper, if somebody came to you and wanted a new form, there was an entire process. A committee had to look at the paper, approve the paper. We had to figure out how we were going to print the paper. We had to train people on the paper. We had to distribute the paper. It was a whole thing. So there was a reluctance to just keep adding papers to everything. We had a spreadsheet. We had documentation areas where nurses could write free text but we didn't keep adding screens and screens and data upon data. Once we got um, computerization, and I'm sorry, I'm guilty of this, people would come to us, we learned how to build a screen, and they'd say, we need this on a screen. We need this data. We didn't ask why or what they were gonna do with it. We just said, okay, and we built the screen. I don't know if many of you participated in that stuff. Well, we had screen upon screen upon screen, until finally, nurses had hundreds of screens to fill out, most of which the data was never used again, was not relevant to nursing, belonged to somebody else, but they gave it to the nurses to enter. And we have documentation burden. Unfortunately, here in the US, a lot of documentation burden is focused on the physician. But I hazard to say the biggest documentation burden is among nurses who are seemingly attached to computers their entire shift documenting something or the other. And I know that because I'm a patient and I watch them. That documentation burden, according to Dr. Susan McBride, leads to moral distress. Nurses who feel like they can't do what they're supposed to do with their patient because they're so busy documenting, right? Or they're documenting things that they don't want to because the computer system forces them to do it. So. Dr. McBride did a big study of Texas nurses and found not only did they have burden, but they were feeling this moral distress and they were writing about it. This causes, this is a contributor, not a sole contributor to workforce burnout. Nurses are like, I'm not going to go home. I'm not going to spend an extra hour every shift at, at the end of 12 and a half hours, making sure all my paperwork is done. So you have workforce burnout. Interesting, during COVID, we were able to take a look at our documentation and say, what can we get rid of? And they did. They got rid of stuff. And guess what? The world didn't end. <laughs> Everybody was fine. The nurses were able to document what they needed to document. Everybody saw it. And the world did not end. We got rid of a lot of stuff that wasn't needed. So now health systems are going through all their documentation, their emission, and they're saying, what is it that we actually need? What do we never use again? What can somebody else collect? Why, do we, why are we collecting this? And then we have standardized terminologies. Oh my. Well, we can't have AI. We can't have our, um, our good data analytics unless we get our standardized terminologies under control. And we're doing that by having, letting the nurses have what they want on the front end of the standardized terminologies in the US, because in many countries, they have one terminology. ICMP, everybody has to use it, end of story. We don't hear. 
but the nurses can choose, you know, Omaha system or of Dr. Saba's CCC or whatever they choose, one of the 12. But behind the scenes, those concepts of pain, skin, falls, all those concepts of interest to nursing have been modeled and coded to SNOMED and LOINC. So in the back end, the nurse's documentation is standardized. On the front end, they see what they want to see. Now, the trick is the nurses can't sit there in a committee and make up their drop-down boxes. That doesn't work. They have to choose one of the standardized terminologies to use because those are what are being coded in SNOMED and LOINC on the database side. So the nurses can see what they want to see in the front end, but the back end has been standardized so you can have interoperabil interoperability, data exchange, shareable, comparable data. I hope that makes sense. And you can look at the work of the Nursing Knowledge Big Data Science and Coding and Modeling Group and the concepts of interest that they've worked on, what they've done in SNOMED and LOINC. Through the Nursing Knowledge Big Data Science Group, there is a... Um, there is a uh, URL there. And right now we're just drowning in everybody wanting to know about artificial intelligence, right? Keeping up with this. Well, we have got to, we have got to educate the basic nurse and faculty and educator what it is and what it isn't, right? What, what is AI? How is it related to uh, machine language learning and all these things? We have to figure out how to do that in a way that they're gonna understand and not overwhelm them. I'm right now looking at AI for Dummies book so I can figure out how to pare it down because at my school, we're gonna offer um, mandatory webinars, one hour webinars on AI, both from a healthcare perspective and an education perspective. We're gonna talk about the pros and cons of AI within healthcare and, and, and uh, all the other sectors. And we will dig into some of the cybersecurity issues because they are significant. And I've given you a website for that. We also have now another hot topic, which is genomics and precision health and medicine. We can now read the human genome quicker, faster, deeper, whatever. That data combined with the patient's social determinants of health data, which consists of data where you live, work, play, pray, what you eat, um, your environment, you name it, it's all in there. Whether you have housing, whether you have access to food, that's all being dumped into the EHR and nurses are expected to respond to it. That's a big issue because they don't always know how to respond to it. What do you do? Do you, ref do you refer your patients to a food bank? How do you understand their genomics? How do you help a patient understand that there may be a targeted medicine for you? when suddenly they see a 50 page document appear in their personal health record. So I'm on another ANA, American Nurses Association committee, looking at what we're going to expect nurses to know from genetics, genomics, and precision health, and what competencies they're gonna to need to know at all levels. And at minimum, our nurses are gonna to need to know how to understand that these things uh, are important to patient care that we can target patients' care to have better outcomes. Um, they need to be able to refer. I do not expect them to understand all the scientific details of a targeted medicine, but they need to understand that certain patients don't react well to a hypertensive. Certain patients are not going to react well to an anti-anxiety drug. There are a number of things that are inborn within our bodies that cause us to react differently. One of the things I always find fascinating that one of my CRNA faculty has been looking at is the pain, um, pain, the pain levels that are actually driven by genetics of various races. Uh, people who have red hair don't respond well to pain medicine, so they feel pain more. There's all sorts of interesting things that are showing up because we now can read the genome and understand it and then look at what's happening to people that have that specific marker. So these are challenges. And in, as we're trying to do the foundations over here, right? We got these challenges that are over here. So it's a constant chase 
And it's a constant chase to figure out how to take that information and level it to what the various audience needs, whether it's a new nurse, an advanced practice nurse with a master's or higher, a patient, a faculty member, an educator, a leader, an executive. We have to level that stuff all the way up and down. So our giant ship with those that cargo on it is really, really uh, working hard to turn around and make the model work, to make the education work, so that our nurses can be competent and capable to participate in this health evolution at all levels. I have provided you with a lot of references, page after page, current resources that you can use, page after page, including some fire slide chats I've been involved in, articles that are out there, links to work, and group, work group presentations and papers, more resources, more resources. And I thank you very much for hanging in here as I tried to tackle a huge, huge topic. I hope I didn't confuse everybody with my boat, trying to turn my boat around. So I am ready to answer questions that you might have. Hello. Thank you so much, Professor. Thanks for your very informative lecture. You, you showed that the pathway, the, the methods, how to prepare the competent nurses to be <clears throat> a leader for the digitalization of the healthcare. So, and uh, the, you, you, you mentioned so many references. There are so many opportunities through the references that you mentioned through the organizations, associations, and collaboration between academician industries and the healthcare sectors. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so dear parts, oh, okay. So I see yeah. there was a question about genetics and yes, genomics. Exactly. Yes, exactly. I, I, would, rec I no. would recommend, you know, looking at that through our National Institute of Health site, they've got some very good information about genetics and genomics and precision health. If you Google it, you can see from the NIH, um, I am looking to see if I have a textbook in it um, that I can recommend, and I'm not seeing one offhand, but I would go and I would look at what's out there on the National Institutes of Health and some of their materials that are both written for um, patients and written for professionals. Okay, thank you so much. Now it's the time of questions. If you want to open your mic, just raise your hand. Uh, there are many questions in the chat box. I think uh, Ishqi, yes, Ishqi asked about why there is not, why there is no available uniform definition of nursing informatics. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, we well, there we hope that the scope and standards put out a uniform definition, but AMIA has one, HIMSS has one, but they all have a core set of understanding, which is the data to information to knowledge to wisdom. That's always the core everywhere. Um, so yeah, I, I we've tried to get one definition, but you know, it's hard to get those organizations to agree. But we know that the core is the same as the core is the same for whether you're a physician informatician or a pharmacy informatician or a radiology informatician, whatever you are, Whatever your specialty is, we all have that core of data to information to knowledge to wisdom. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, dear participant, just for uh, in your information, the link of registration has been published on the chat box and the WhatsApp group has been published as well. Uh, so I'm waiting for your questions. Well, I see one that says, um, Two questions. Is nursing informatics poised to become one of the foremost disciplines in nursing? Yes. Well, I certainly hope so. <laughs> I'd like to push that. I don't know if it's going to happen, but certainly with the recognition of the technology that is um, uh, available to us, the um, it should be. We do have to have our colleagues recognize that that Again, informatics and information technology is not a separate thing, separate from caring, it's part of your caring. 
Mm -hmm. So, and then given its importance in enhancing other specialties, do you think the specialty has earned the recognition? Um, I have to say that we're still fighting for recognition um, in many ways, which um, to me is bothersome. Uh, I think we, we have to, we all internationally have to continue that fight, all of us across the yeah. globe, because we all share in a similar um, set of problems. And I do see Dr. Hebda said, American Nurses Association definition for nursing informatics is newer. Yes, it is newer. Absolutely, you are that you are very true. It's very true, Dr. Hebda. Thank you. Um, how much AI will have influence it? Well, it's already in there. It's already built into some of our systems. We have to have a much more robust standardized terminology set to make better use of our AI or potential for AI. But, excuse me, it is built into things like sepsis alerts and things like that. Maybe not as much as it is in the medicine side, but it's, it is coming in there. But again, we have to have that foundational standardized terminology or you can't, you can't gather the data. It's hard to pull it out of um, nursing notes, right? Doing natural language processing of nursing notes is time consuming and expensive and organizations don't always want to invest in that. And, and if you go back and look at some nursing notes, they're not really all that wonderful. So. We've got to get our standardized terminologies under control so that we can have a much bigger uh, usage of AI right now. Uh, let's see. Um, I think there is a suggestion from Dr. Seilani. She mentioned that, many thanks for professor. And she said that our use of uh, nursing informatics is limited to some statistics and financial purposes. Yes. <laughs> Yes, yes. In the field of, uh, in the field, uh, based on running EHR, EHR. So uh, while I understand we should have a serious revision on our curriculum and include required and related credits in the school. She recommended like that. Thank you so much, Dr. Yeah, one of the things that my group is trying to get people to realize is that, and, and I had this in my own school, Informatics and information technology are not the same as stats and analytics. It's part of <clears throat> certainly informatics and information technology. <coughs> Excuse me, are used to support the collection of data, <coughs> the formation of statistics and analytics. But there is um, there is a slight difference. <clears throat> and we often get shortchanged by being pushed into that. We often get shortchanged by just focusing on the EHR. But part of that is our own responsibility to expand out people's understanding that we're looking at the outcomes of all these technologies, not just the EHR. E EHR is important. I'm not giving any, um, I'm not diminishing that, but it's not everything that one uses. So, Part of that's gonna be our communication. And Celestine wants to know the difference between clinical informatics and health informatics. I will tell you that that definition, that difference is actually coming from AMIA. AMIA views physician informaticians as doing clinical informatics. I argue that that is wrong. And all the rest of us who are not physicians do health informatics. Again, I argue that that is not correct, but that is a definition, that is a difference that's being promulgated by AMIA. Not seeing it in the international side, but in our side, I am. And we are, those of us nurses who do a lot of work in the clinical setting are pushing back on their, their subdivision. So Celestine, it's, a, it's really kind of a um, arbitrary organization difference. Let's see. Yes. And uh, there's a question from Mehdi again. What advice does Dr. Wilson have for young nursing undergraduate students who wish to pro proceed their studies in MSc and have among the options nursing informatics? 
Well, first of all, you have to make sure you have strong informatics content within that baccalaureate or that new nurse program so they understand what it is, right? Oftentimes, that's not um, a very strong part of their education in, in many schools. We're trying to reverse that. So they need to understand what it is. They also need to be, <clears throat> if they're working in a work environment, supported to be a super user when a new thing is coming up, to participate in committees and things like that. So they understand the role that they're preparing to take on. And then they have a better appreciation for the work that they have to do or might want to do within a graduate program, which can be very different. It can be leadership, it can be implementation, it can be project management, it can be analytics. You know, we can focus on many things in our graduate programs, but they need to have exposure from the beginning in their education and then exposure within their um, professional development post graduation. Trying to Great. look at the chat box and everything else. Yes. Uh, there's a question from Nikovia uh, asking about the recommended book or book or uh, uh, book on genetics. Yeah, I think I, it, yeah, I, I can send some books. I didn't do that homework very well, I guess. But if you look under the National Institutes of Health site uh, for the US and look up genetics and genomics, you see a lot of good information, but I will certainly look for a good book. And it's usually found in the things like precision health. I can send some articles through Dr. Darvish who can send them out. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there is two questions, two related questions from Abdul Malik, dear Abdul Malik. He, uh, he thanks you for your valuable presentation and really appreciate it. He has two questions. Is nursing informatics supposed to be to, to become one of the foremost discipline in nursing, con considering its significance across various nursing domains? The second one, given its importance in enhancing other specialities, do you think this specialty has earned the recognition it uh, rightfully that reverses? Yeah, I think I talked about this before. Um, it's going to be up to us to make sure this is a preeminent role. We have to be the ones that say, again, technology is part of your caring. You must participate in these things. You need to be competent to do certain things. That's going to be up to us as informaticians to get that message out and not just speak to ourselves, but to speak to our colleagues. And the second question, um, Second question, I'm trying to remember what the second question was. Do I think it has earned? No, my personal yes. feeling is no, we have not earned the recognition we should have. And we need to take responsibility for that. We need to. We are the ones that have to share what we contribute to healthcare better than just going to meetings and speaking to ourselves, right? We got to get out there and we got to talk to other nurses about what it is we do and how we impact patient care. Yes, it, uh, there is a question from the Christian Tomato. Ask it about, I need a little cl clarification on the differences between clinical informatics and health informatics. Yeah, I, I talked about that before. That was the designation that AMIA set up. Clinical informatics, they, well, they give to the physician informaticians and all the rest of us who are not physicians, they call us health informaticians. It's an arbitrary boundary because many of us work in the clinical sector, uh, clinical sphere, and aren't really happy with that division. Okay, I think there is no more question. Uh, I know that you are tired, dear <laughs> professor. Just I have two questions. Sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, the first one is based on your experience. Which association or organization is the best one or suitable for the students or for the novel beginners in this field? And the second one, do you think that the uh, AI 
will solve the mental health problems for, in the future? Well, boy, that's a, the second one's kind of a big question. Do I think AI is going to solve the mental health problems? You know, I, I view AI now as a tool, right? It's a tool. Is it going to solve a problem for us? It's going to provide us with information that we have to use our critical thinking and clinical reasoning to really decide if that information is real, can be trusted, before we start using it to actually make decisions for us. Certainly, I can see it looking at symptoms and various things and giving us ideas about what patients may have. Do I think it's going to be... Um, at this point in time in development, basically telling us what to do. I certainly hope not because I don't think we're there yet to be able to trust it. But the first one, for the first one, um, the first question, oh Lord, I forgot, went out of my brain. What was your first question? I was, oh, organization. Association, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, some of that depends on your interest. Um, Amy, the American Medical Informatics Association is very research oriented. So if you're a research person, that's where you want to be. If you're more interested in product and what products do, what they look like when they go to market, the newest things that people are trying, the outcomes, then HIMSS is where you want to be. Um, so it depends on what your, your like focus is. I belong to all of them because I get something out of all of them. But um, if you're a researcher, like a real pure researcher, you want to be in AMIA. If you are interested in being the pro understanding products, what's happening out there in the marketplace, what they're trying to do, then you want to be involved in HIMSS nursing informatics. That's my simple answer. Very and Dr. Uh, Matt yeah. Hardy says they're not seeing a lot of AI or e-health research. No, uh -huh. we're not. I mean, this is just suddenly like it's been around, you know, we've had it for a while. That's not new, but, you know, suddenly we're hearing about this in education and in healthcare, and it's like AI, AI, AI. Um, so our research in the field is lagging behind the product as we usually are. We are doing, we're, we're writing policy about students using things like chat GPT to do their homework. They've been using it. They have been using it. The students found it and they used it. So we're always sort of behind what, you know, what the technology is pushing us towards. We don't have a way of knowing what's going to happen in the future. So we're always sort of behind the, what we call behind the eight ball. If you do billiards, you know, it's the eight ball. We're always behind it. So anyway, you're not seeing a lot. You're going to start, but not yet. Not yet. Yes, that's the exact. Uh, again and again, thank you so much, dear professor, dear participants. At the end of this session, please, before leave the session, activate your camera to take a group photo. And I'm going to stop share so I can see everybody. A oh, gallery. Oh my! What a what a group. Okay. 114 people, I'm honored. Yes, 115. Thank you, the Professor uh, Wilson. That was great. And uh, I also want to welcome uh, Professor Hepta. She's with us. And uh, I'm so happy. And if she wants to speak, um, it's good. We will be happy. I don't know if she can hear me or not. Hello, Tony. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we wait for uh, audiences and they should open their camera and take a group photo. Okay, Professor Hepta says I am on mute. Okay, just a minute. Uh, yes, now you can speak. And if you want a camera also, I can open it. 
it's thank you very much. This was a marvelous presentation, and again, I want to thank our hopes, our, our hosts, because of the opportunity to have a discussion on informatics, which is critically important to advance what we do. So, thank you. Yeah, I cannot, I cannot stress enough that our international voices are extremely important, that the issues we are facing for the most part are, faced, are, are being faced all across the globe. And we have been quiet far too long in our corners doing our work, speaking to each other. And now it's time that we take our voices in this international group and tell people nursing and informatics go hand in hand. They're not separate. As I tell my faculty, we do not teach nurses. We don't teach nursing students to put a stethoscope around their neck and just wear it. We teach them how to put it in their ears, listen to the heart sounds, which is data, form information and act on it, right? No different. It's part of their day-to-day -day life. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to see the uh, picture uh, and video of uh, Professor Hepta also here. Thank you. <laughs> and all the participants, thank you so much. Now, uh, I just, just uh, please wait for two minutes. I will ask if they took the photo, then we can leave the session and close the camera. Just wait, please. Slowly, we're seeing the faces show up. Some people are shy, it looks like. <laughs> uh, I should appreciate the Appraise to Race team behind this session. Um, and for all the supports of uh, international affairs of TOMS, and also uh, Mrs. Um, Nafisa Smiley, uh, who moderated the chat box. And uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Dora, uh, because of uh, very nice uh, managing the questions and answers. And thank you. Professor uh, Wilson for very nice answers and nice questions from the participants. Um, so I think she said uh, she's taking photo. Everyone needs to smile. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Now she is written that a lot of a lot of photos have been taken. And uh, Dr. Dara, you may finish the session. Just remind them for next session on Saturday. Thank you all. Thanks for being with us. Uh, see you inshallah on Saturday, next Saturday, 19th of August, at the same time, 17th uh, time. Inshallah, we will see you, and I, we hope you in the best health and security. Thank you so much. Thank you, and I wish uh, very nice uh, um, days and uh, health for uh, Professor Wilson. Thank you. Thank you very much for being a very patient, wonderful audience as I tried to cover a very large topic. Um, really? A very broad topic in the amount of time that we have. Most of these things could be their own lecture by themselves. So 
You've been very patient. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye. Quarter half. Quarter half. Thank you. <laughs>